Our scripture today comes from Luke chapter 3. Hear these words. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Again, we're so glad that you have joined us in worship this morning. Surprise, because uh, I'm the preaching pastor this morning. Uh, Reverend McMurray is out uh, today. But I want us to think about this scripture we just heard. Because two weeks ago, we celebrated the birth of a tiny newborn being born into the world that would change everything. Now, we fast forward 30 years to the baptism of Jesus. So I want to pause before we move forward because I want to catch us up just a little. Do you remember your first job? Think about that for just a second. My first job was digging ditches and house footings for my grandfather's construction company. And every morning at 6.45 a.m., Mr. Floyd Pearson would come and pick me up in his car. In the back of the car, the trunk was never latched because he had all the tools in there and handles were sticking out, all the tools that we would use in our day's work. That summer taught me a lot about work ethic. That summer also taught me a lot about colorful language. My second job in high school was working as a radio announcer for KRLW in Walnut Ridge. And each Sunday after church, I would take the cassette tape of our service and dash to the radio station. I worked on Sunday afternoons with the agreement that I would be off in time to get back to the church for youth group that evening. The AM station went off the air at 5 o'clock in the afternoon on Sundays, and so I would lock up and head back to the church because that was also important. From my early days in elementary school, I remember listening to that AM station, not just for local news or to find out if school was canceled for a snow day in the winter, but also to listen to radio personality Paul Harvey. Paul Harvey had worked in radio since the early 1940s, and he was masterful at weaving a story that made you want to listen and leave you hanging on every word. He would say things like, if pro is the opposite of con, what is the opposite of progress? He would say things like, it's helpful to remember in times like these that there have always been times like these. And as I read through Luke's gospel, I could not help but think of Paul Harvey and his morning news program. Now, for those of you that have never heard of Paul Harvey, he would usually tell some story about something famous, famous people, maybe minor characters in that story, tell us their background, a little, about little known facts that most of us didn't know, And he would always end his broadcast with, and now you know the rest of the story. I'm Paul Harvey. Good day. 
Now, to go past where, what our reading was on Christmas Eve, it will require us to suspend parts of the Christmas story that we have embedded in our brain. First, Luke makes no mention of the Magi, the scholars from the East. Luke makes no mention of King Herod and the slaughter of the innocents. Luke chapter 2 is the only time that we really hear anything about Jesus between the time of his birth and the time he begins his ministry. The chapter highlights his dedication. The chapter highlights his naming before God and then the, the familiar story of him teaching in the temple when his parents accidentally left him there. That's a different sermon. All while I was reading, I could not help but be reminded that these two events we read about Jesus as a child mirror the ages that we see babies being baptized and sixth graders being confirmed in the church. After that beautiful birth story and away in a manger in silent night, we skip ahead, and we read about the Jewish practice of the law. Luke wanted to show that Mary and Joseph were very devout Jews, and what kind of home Jesus would be raised in. Verse 21 of chapter 2 tells us that on the eighth day, they named Jesus and had him circumcised according to the Jewish law. And then verse 22, Luke tells us that they came to the temple in Jerusalem for Mary's cleansing, 40 days after the birth, which was required by Jewish law. So Jesus was a little over a month old. And I'm guessing that they went back to Nazareth after the birth. Things were getting back to normal, as, as normal as you can with a newborn baby in the house. But then Luke tells us that they make the trip back to the temple for this purification ritual common practice. Now, thinking back to when our son was a month old, Karen and I were a wreck. Lack of sleep, our world was literally turned upside down. But Mary and Joseph make the journey with a baby back to Jerusalem, and they approach the temple, and it's at this point we're introduced to a little old man named Simeon. The word Simeon means God has heard. Simeon has been waiting like so many others for the coming of the Messiah. Three times in verses 25 to 27, Luke mentions that the Holy Spirit was with Simeon. Three times. The Holy Spirit rested on him. The Holy Spirit revealed to him. And he was led by the Spirit to be in this place at this time. Simeon was led to the temple area just as Mary and Joseph were approaching the temple. The temple complex is massive. Simeon didn't know what he was looking for, but he was looking for a glimpse of something. He was just there. He was not told anything about a baby. Simeon did not get the same memo that the shepherds had received. He was promised to see the Messiah before he died, and he was going in hopeful expectation of this promise. And remember, the Jews believed that the Messiah was going to be a mighty warrior to rise up and fight against their enemies. But Simeon, Simeon sees a baby in his mother's arms, and he takes the baby from Mary and begins singing praises to God for letting him see this gift, this miracle, this Messiah. In my cartoon version of this story, I find it really funny. Karen reminds me that this would not have been funny to Mary for a little old man to grab a newborn baby out of his mother's arms. So Simeon now had the child, and 
he is singing praises to God and says, now, master, let your servant go in peace according to your word, because my eyes have seen your salvation. You prepared this salvation in the presence of all peoples. It's a light of revelation for the Gentiles and for the glory of your people, Israel. In other words, Simeon is saying to God that now he can die in peace because he knows the light of the world has come. The light has come for Israel and her people and for all Gentiles. He gives the baby back to Mary and Joseph, blesses them and tells them what this little baby is going to do in his life. And then he looks at Mary and he says to Mary, that this is going to be a hard road for her as well. And then he leaves. The second testimony in this chapter had to do in, with Anna. Anna was a prophet. Uh, he, she was an old woman that was in the temple daily to fast and pray. Really, Anna was the first evangelist. She was a widow woman who lived in the temple complex. And whereas Simeon focused directly on the child and his parents, Anna was a prophet and she saw what was going on and she started praying. She started praying and praising God and and talking to people about Jesus and who he is. Anna saw Jesus and was inspired to take action. So what do we see What do we see in this child? Maybe we see ourselves. Maybe we see ourselves broken, sinful, sad, in need of repair. Maybe weighed down by the work that must be done in our world and in ourselves. Yet like Simeon and Anna, can we we catch just a glimpse? Can we catch a glimpse of what we will look like with God working within us. We know all about this Jesus. We know what Jesus can do in our lives. We even know what Jesus can do in spite of us. So we focus on the early part of Luke chapter 2, but not on the later portions about Simeon and Anna. They both lived in that expectation that they would experience Christ, the Messiah, in their lifetime. Do we have that expectation as well? What do we live in expectation of? Do we live to experience the Christ in our lives? Or is this what we do for an hour a week to catch a glimpse and then go back to our calendars, our busy calendars, and all the other things that we have to do? When we open up ourselves and we're fully alive in God, fully alive in that anticipation that Christ is going to meet us in our lives, we find ourselves living out the promise and seeing the Christ all around us, even in the simple, even in the mundane. Most of our baptisms in the United Methodist Church are infant baptisms. When you look at a child that's being presented for baptism, Can you envision all that they might be in their lives? Do you think that God still looks at us that way? Can you tell when someone is alive in God? Are we alive in God? And and what does that even mean? Maybe it means that we live each day watching for where Christ does appear around us in our lives. And maybe it's how we're moved by that action. Believing and action go hand in hand. As James wrote, faith without works is dead. One of my favorite books is called The Carpenter and the Unbuilder by David Grebner. And he shares this story that I want to share with you. Once there was a rich man who entertained himself by collecting things. One day in an antique store... He was intrigued to discover what appeared to be a large, full-length mirror. He couldn't be sure because all he could see was the frame. A heavy canvas covered what he most likely thought was a mirror. 
A faded piece of paper was pinned to the canvas that said, do not remove. So he called to the store owner. What is this and why is it covered? He asked. He was used to getting his way. Oh, you won't believe me, came the reply. Well, tell me anyway, he demanded. Again, he was used to getting his way. Well, continued the store owner. Under the canvas is a mirror. The story is that this mirror will only reflect the part of you that is alive in God, in God. So I keep it covered because it's bad for business. Too many people don't see what they expect to see. Will you let people look if they want to? The man asked. Not usually, but some insist. Mostly, they're the ones that don't believe me. And once they take the canvas off and look, they tend to leave without buying anything in the store. As I said, it's bad for business. The man persisted. Well, may I look? If you must. The wealthy man thought for a moment and then reassured by the knowledge that his accountant keeps his church pledge up to date, he peeled the canvas aside and stood in front of the full-length mirror. I don't see anything. He shouted, wondering immediately if the light was bad. There always has been something there. Look closer. And sure enough, down at the bottom of the mirror, like a lonely radish, was his big toe. My toe, he mumbled. That's all there is. Well, that's all there is for now, said the store owner. You mean it can change, the man asked. Name your price for this mirror. Well, the store owner wasn't at all unhappy to see the mirror go. The collector took the mirror home with him. And many times each day he would stand in front of the mirror, but nothing ever changed. Only the big toe on his left foot was visible. He tried everything to alter this appearance, this one annoying fact. He stood in front of the mirror in a $2,000 hand-tailored suit. He stood there with all his bank and stock certificates, nothing. He stood there with his award from a service organization for his help during the last fundraiser. He paraded in front of the mirror, holding a certificate of dismissal from a well-known psychotherapist, nothing. He went to church. He went to church every week, sometimes twice, and always saved the bulletin to show the mirror. No response. Nothing but that one big toe. Well, at last, he gave most of his money away. And as he stood before the mirror, he thought he noticed a slight change in the image of his toe. It gave him some hope. Upon closer examination, it revealed that it was only his toenail had grown a little longer. And finally, there was nothing else for him to pursue. He had no new ideas, nothing more to offer the mirror. Still, he could not stop looking at it and thinking about it. And in his helplessness, one day, he broke down in front of the mirror, and he cried. He wept for his weakness. He wept for his emptiness. He wept out of frustration. He wept for reasons he couldn't even begin to explain. And then in the next moment, he let go. He let go of his need to be in control of everything. He let go of his need to figure out how the mirror worked. His heart opened not to how he desired to know the mystery of the mirror, but to how the mystery of the mirror desired to be known. His eyes were so full of tears that he did not notice, dimly at first, and then with greater and greater definition, His other toes, foot, feet, legs, arms, torso, shoulders, neck, and head filling up the mirror. When you stand before that mirror, what part of you is alive in God? My prayer for all of us is to let go. Like Simeon, let God lead and commit to look for the Christ child everywhere we go.
in the everyday to catch a glimpse of who the Christ child fully is and who the Christ child calls us to be. And like Anna, respond to the Christ child and what Christ is doing in each of our lives and will continue to do not only in our lives, but in the lives of those around us. And then we fast forward. We fast forward when we come to Jesus being baptized. My mother and I always have interesting conversations about baptism. Two of my sister's children have not been baptized. My mother would love nothing more than for me to show up on a nice summer day to their pool and dunk them in the pool saying, remember your baptism. I mean, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I told my mom that to me, that really puts the emphasis on the water and not what God does in our lives. And that when we are baptized, there's also a response from the community, from the community of faith to be there for us on our journey. Theologian David Luce writes, all Christian traditions emphasize that baptism is God's work. Notice, interestingly, that in Luke's account, John does not actually baptize Jesus. In the verses omitted by the lectionary, which we read earlier, verses 19 and 20, we learn that John is actually imprisoned during this time by Herod. So who then baptizes Jesus? The Holy Spirit. In fact, it's the same Spirit that baptizes us. Baptism is God's work in us that we might have confidence that no matter how often we fail, no matter what we do, that cannot remove our identity in God. Our relationship with God is the one relationship in life that we can't screw up. We can neglect it. We can run away from it, we can deny it, we can ignore it, but we cannot destroy it because God loves each of us too deeply and too completely to ever let us go. In an age where so many relationships are so fragile, it's good news that this relationship with God is is solid no matter what. And when we trust this relationship is in God's hands, we're freed to give ourselves wholly and completely to other relationships in our lives. So what would happen if every time that you took a shower or every time you washed your hands or even sanitized them for that matter, that we thought about our relationship with God and remembered our baptism and our promises, the promises that God made to us in it. And baptism, though, conducted only once, was never intended to be a once-and-done event, but rather something that we remember and renew daily. Now, in the United Methodist Church, we believe in one baptism, whether it's done as a baby or as a confirmand or as an adult, one time. And people will say that they want to remember it, or I feel that I've fallen away from God and want to renew my relationship with God. Rebaptism would simply imply that God didn't work the first time. This is one reason that we remember our baptism. And I believe that when we remember our baptism, we're remembering in it the past, we're remembering in it the present, and we're even remembering the future. When you come down here and receive the shell, whether you've been formally baptized or not, I want you to hear God's promise of you are my beloved child whom I love and with you I am well pleased. In other words, I am God's beloved child called to make a difference in the world. Baptism is about our identity God's beloved children, children and people so precious, so precious that God would go to any length to communicate that to us, that love, even to the point of dying on a cross. 
And this is why baptism is so important. As in an age where we're trying to figure out who we are, it's never been more complex. Baptism suggests that we best understand who by paying attention to whose we are. Whose we are as God's beloved children. Baptism reminds us that we have an infinite value, an infinite worth to God, that God wants only good things for us, that God will always seek to draw us back into a relationship with God. Not only into a relationship with God, but into a relationship with each other. God forgives us when we stray. God will be with us each and every day. In a minute, as the band plays, you're going to be invited to come forward and receive a shell from this bowl. And I'll hand you that shell. And I hope you hear those words. You are my beloved child. I love you. And with you, I am well pleased. Amen. Amen.